Good morning, boys and girls. Today we're going to read part two of the Plains Indians, the first nation of North America. And the last time we left off on page 21. So today we're going to start with page 22. So if you're reading along at home, go to page 22 in your book. What were early Plains Indian communities like? The nomadic hunters of the early Great Plains lived in teepees. Teepees were made of bison hides sewn together. The hides covered a frame of wooden poles that formed a cone shape. Inside the teepee was a fire pit lined with rocks. Beds made of bison hides were arranged around the fire. People often decorated teepee covers with painted figures that represented the family or showed the great deeds of the hunter or warrior who lived inside. As people moved across the Great Plains, they carried their teepees with them. Teepees could be quickly taken apart and put back together with each move to the new camp. This is a large teepee. Large teepees might be made of as many as 18 bison hides. This is a wood could be hard to find in the Great Plains, so people use saw and earth to build these houses. Houses of farming people. So these are the nomadic people with the teepees. These are the farming people. Houses of farming peoples. Since the farming tribes of the Great Prairie did not move around as much as the nomadic hunters, they built more permanent homes. The Wichita and Caddo people built grass houses by covering a circular framework of wooden poles with thick bundles of grass called thatch. Other farming tribes lived in earth lodges with domes, like roofs. These lodges were made of heavy timber posts covered by willow branches and layers of sod, the surface layer of the ground of the earth and earth. People entered their lodges through a covered tunnel. This led to a roomy interior that could hold a number of families or related persons. Like the hunting tribes, farming people also use teepees, but only for their yearly hunting trips onto the Great Plains. So when they went hunting, they used the teepee. Otherwise, they lived in these kinds of buildings. Villages. The farming tribes and prairies lived in permanent villages. Some of the larger tribes, such as the Pawnee and of Nebraska, were made up of 10 or more villages. Farming tribes usually settled near large rivers or streams, which provided water to maintain their farms. These tribes arranged their lodges close to each other at the center of the village. Farm fields were located at the edge of the village surrounding their lodges. Villages often offered protection from enemy raiders. The Mandan and the Arikara people established their villages on bluffs high above the Missouri River. This allowed them to spot any approaching enemies. The Mandans also surrounded their villages with high fences which with pointed stakes called palisades. For added security, other tribes built large mounds of packed earth called ramparts to protect their villages. This says, this painting by George Caitlin shows an Arikara village on the Grand River of South Dakota. Teepees were suited to the nomadic lives of the plains hunters. Some villages became major trading centers where tribes from around the Great Plains gathered. They exchanged valuable goods like dried corn, buffalo hides, and beaver furs. Bands. 
The nomadic tribes did not settle in permanent villages. In the winter, they split into small bands or groups to hunt bison and small game. In the spring and summer, as the bison gathered in large herds, the Indians came together as tribes. These summer gatherings gave them the chance to meet as a tribe and discuss the future of their people. Some camps might include a thousand people with tipis set up in a huge circle. This picture says cradle boards allowed Indian Plains Indian women to keep their infants with them while they worked. Plants. In an early Plains Indian family, everyone worked together to support each other. Aunts, uncles, and grandparents all helped parent, educate, and raise the children. Family members were also part of the larger unit called clans. A clan is a group of people who share a common ancestor or family member from the distant past. In some tribes, membership in a clan was passed on from the mother to their children. In others, clan membership was passed on from the father to their children. Roles for men and women. Men and women each had their own roles to play in the daily life. For men, life revolved around hunting and warfare. They trained and tended horses, and they made weapons such as bows and arrows and lances. They also were leaders making decisions about where their people should hunt and where, whether they should start a war. Women tended farm fields and homes. They put up and took down teepees. They made clothing, hauled firewood, and prepared meals. They cared for the children and carried infants on their back in baby carriers called cradle boards as they worked. A day in the life of the early Plains Indian child. On a typical day in the early Plains Indian village, children might listen to the storyteller tell about the history of their people. Boys might prepare to become warriors and hunters by learning to ride horses and shoot bows and arrows at targets. Girls would probably learn the skills of cooking, sewing, and other crafts as they helped their mothers. The caption for this picture says, family was very important to the early, as well as the modern American Indians. Adults taught children the skills they would need to survive. How were early Plains Indian tribes organized? Early Plains Indian tribes were made up of bands or villages that were led by chiefs. Leaders became chiefs by demonstrating bravery in warfare or great skills in hunting. Chiefs were highly respected, but they did not give orders to the rest of the people. Instead, they tried to guide their people and offer wise advice. Chiefs led with the help of a council made up of other respected men. The Cheyenne were led by a council of 44 chiefs representing the tribe's various bands. When the bands gathered each summer, their leaders met to discuss issues facing their people. The Cheyenne people still maintain a council of 44 people today. For this picture, it says, this painting from 1832 shows a Blackfeet chief named Buffalo Bulls Blackfeet, Backfeet. During council meetings, people smoked pipes like the, like the one this crow man is holding. That's a long pipe. Plain Indian made important decisions only after much discussion and after everyone had the chance to express an opinion. Comanche leaders would gather in a circle to discuss concerns, with each person taking a turn speaking. Language, sign language. Because they traveled so widely, the Plains Indians often encountered people of other tribes. In many cases, tribes spoke languages so different from each other that communicating would be impossible. 
So Plains Indians developed a sign language system that all could use and understand. They used hand and arm gestures to communicate ideas. Their hand talk was especially useful when people of many different tribes gathered to trade. War. Early Plains Indians took great pride in showing their bravery in battle. A warrior who was successful in battle became a hero to his people. Groups of warriors raided other tribes to capture horses, gain wealth, and win glory. One of the greatest feats a warrior could achieve was to count, to count coup. This meant striking an enemy with a weapon on bare hands and escaping unharmed. Only a warrior who had the courage to get close enough to his enemy to touch him could claim to have counted coup. In this painting from the 1800s shows the plains warriors battling on horseback. This painting this painting from the 1830s shows a Mandan chief named Four Bears. The eagle feather in his headdress were earned by performing great deeds. Special societies, warriors who won the respect of their people became members of special societies reserved for the bravest and strongest. The Cheyenne had a society of warriors called the Dog Soldiers who led them in battle and on hunts. Some tribes had as many as eight or ten such societies. These societies completed, competed against each other in games of, at tribal gatherings. Members of honor societies went to great length to show their courage. Among the Kiowa warriors sometimes stalked their sash into the ground during a battle. This was a signal that the warrior would remain there and keep fighting until death if necessary. When a great warrior reached old age, he became a leader among his people. Among the Lakota Sioux, elderly warriors joined headman societies and were looked to for guidance and wisdom. What objects did the Plains Indians create? The early Plains Indians were skilled at making everyday items such as suited their nomadic way of life. They made rawhide pouches called parfleches. Plains Indians used these to carry the food they would need on their long journey. Parfleches were strong, light, and easy to carry. Plains women decorated them with bright colors and geometric designs. Modern Plains Indians continue to make parfleches today. Decorative art. Plains women decorated their clothing with porcupine quills. They colored the quills using dyes made from the plants. Then They then arranged the quills to create brightly colored patterns. Warriors wore headdresses made of bison horns or eagle feathers. The eagle feathers were earned by performing heroic deeds or showing bravery. It says, see the painting on page 31. This right here, Indians women were decorated these containers called parfleches. This says, a winter count is a painting record of people's past. This is a winter's count. Art and culture. Winter counts. Plains Indians pass their history on from generation to generation by telling stories of great events in their tribe's past. To keep a record of these events, they use something called the winter count. For early Plains Indians, a winter count was a series of pictures painted on a bison hide. Each picture represented the most important event from a year in the tribe's history. The scenes were painted in a spiral pattern with the earliest event in the center of the most recent on the edge. 
looking at the winter's count would allow storytellers to remember and pass the people's history on to the younger generations. When buffalo became harder to find, Plains Indians began keeping winter counts on paper or other fabric. What did early Plains Indians believe? For the early people of the Great Plains, religion was part of everyday life. They believed that everything in the natural world around them was made by the great creator spirit. Because they believed spirits lived in the animals, plants, earth, and even the wind and rain, they were taught to treat nature with great respect. They gave thanks to these spirits and asked for their help. In this photograph from the early 1900s shows participants prepared for the sun dance. So they were getting ready for the sun dance. In this photograph, Plains Indians got guidance from spirits by going to vision quests. This man is reenacting a Sioux medicine man on a vision quest. Vision quest. Beginning when they were teenagers, early Plains Indians went on vision quests. A person went off alone for a day at a time to fast and pray. The goal was to experience a vision that would allow the person to communicate with the spirit. The spirit would guide him for the rest of his life. Sundance. Almost all Plains tribes practice the Sundance to give thanks to the spirit and celebrate the work of the great creator. Different tribes practice different versions of the dance. Usually a yearly event, it includes community dancing, chanting, and praying. By offering their sacred dances and prayers, they hope for continued strength and success. Some Plains Indians practice the sun dance today, and the ceremony continues to develop over time. How did contact with the non-Indians affect Plains Indians? The Spanish explorer Francisco Velázquez de Coronado came to the plains in Kansas in 1541. He reported meeting Indians in skin tents who hunted wild cows. He was the first European to meet plains Indians and to see their teepees and the bison they hunted. Spanish, French, and later U.S. traders came to the Great Plains in search of valuable bison hide. The Indians acquired guns from these traders. This made them more effective hunters and more fearsome warriors. Here is a painting, explorer Francisco Vasquez de Coronado led Spanish soldiers across the southern Great Plains. And in this picture, Non-Indian hunters killed bison for their hides. Tragically, white traders also brought with them smallpox and other diseases. This took a terrible toll on the Plains Indians. Thousands of Plains Indians died of such diseases, and some entire tribes were wiped out. Settlers moved west. As the United States expanded westward in the late 1800s, non-Indian settlers began to move across the Great Plains. Trails and railroads began to stretch across the Great Plains all the way to California. At the same time, non-Indian hunters trying to sell bison hides for profit slaughtered the animals by the hundreds and thousands. Bisons nearly died out in the 1800s. Farmers and ranchers looking for land to set their sight on the Great Plains. Even though Indians considered the Great Plains their home, settlers saw the land as open country that they could simply take. War for the Great Plains. In the mid-1800s, the U.S. government tried to force Plains Indians to move to reservations. Reservations were public land set aside for, as homelands for the Indians. On reservations, the Plains Indians would have to give up many of their traditional ways of life and depend on the government for support. Plains Indians fought back. In the 1876, thousands of Lakota Sioux and Cheyenne warriors wiped out a force of U.S. soldiers led by General George Custer. 
near the Little Big Horn River in Monta Montana. Custer's defeat only made the United States more determined to conquer the Plains Indians. And this is a painting of the, that shows the last moments of the Battle of Little Big Horn. This right here is a painting of the ghost dance shown here in the newspaper from 1891. It became popular among the Indians on reservations in the late 1800s. Reservations, the U.S. Army began to capture bands of Plains Indians. By the 1880s, the last of the Plains Indians had been confined to reservations. The U.S. government promised Indians that they would be taken care of on the reservations. But too often, Plains Indians found only poverty and sickness. Some turned to a new movement called the Ghost Dance Religion, which thought that the sacred dance would restore their bison and force non-Indian settlers to leave. Some Lakota Sioux participating in the ghost dance clashed with U.S. soldiers at the Wounded Knee, South Dakota, in 1890. Over 150 Lakota were killed, and the ghost dance movement faded. The wars for the Great Plains were over. What is modern life like for Plains Indians? At the start of the 1900s, life on the reservation was harsh. People on reservations were very poor and had poor quality health care. In this photograph, at gatherings like the one at the Crow Fair in Montana, native people of the prairie celebrate their tradition. Reforms brought some improvement. First, in 1924, the U.S. Congress passed a Indian Citizenship Act. This made all Indians citizens of the United States. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 tried to give Indians more control over their lives and allow them to practice traditional ceremonies. But some Plains reservations remained among the poorest places in the country. In 1968, Plains Indian played a leading part in forming the American Indian Movement. This group fights for Indian rights. In 1973, members of the AIM took over the village of the Wounded Knee for 71 days. Their actions focused attention on the problem faced by American Indians. Plains Indians today. Today, Plains Indians live not only on reservations, but also in cities, suburbs, and small towns all across the United States and throughout the world. At tribal colleges, people can prepare for employment and learn about traditional ways. More and more Plains Indians are taking an interest in the languages and traditions of their people. At gatherings by they dress in colorful costumes and proudly perform traditional dances. By remembering their proud history, they prepare for successful futures. Biography Billy Mills Billy Mills, born in 1938, is an Oglala Lakota, a Sioux, who was raised on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. In 1964, he won the gold medal in the 10,000 meter race in the Olympics in Tokyo, Japan. He later helped found Running Strong for American Indian Youth, a group that helped young American Indians in need. Here's a timeline you can look over and the glossary. And you can also find out more in this back section. I hope you enjoyed this book. Again, this was the second part of the Plains Indians book.